Hey, Maya. Good to see you again. Good to see you too, Jenny. How are you? I'm good. Looks like you're working hard in the background there. I know. There's a lot of things going on over there. I don't know what's happening. We're creating a whole new world using bioprinting. That is what's happening. Absolutely. Uh, well, joke around, joke aside, um, I, I kind of want to have this interview with you because I think I would like the 3D Heels 2020 audience to get to know you more before the conference. Um, and we know each other many years, for many years now, right? Ever since the very beginning of 3D Heels, you were the original bioprinting, biofabrication ambassador for 3D Heels. And you were there with the first version of 3D Heels 2017, I believe. And back then, you were a CEO. You're one of the few female founder CEO of a bioprinting company. Um, I was very impressed with your background and your international experience. Uh, but I think my our audience don't really doesn't really know about that. So would you like to share your story on how did you got into bioprinting and then founded your company, three uh, SC three D, right? Absolutely. Yep. And now you transitioned out of that. So love to hear that part of the story. Yeah, definitely. Um, it feels like a really long time ago, but you know, um, I, I was an academic in Singapore at Nanyang Technological University. And at the time when I was a faculty, you know, that was really when 3D printing got started or, or really got hot, so to speak. Everybody is talking about 3D printing and no different for an engineering school um, at, like NTU. So that's how I got it into 3D printing and started my journey in looking at how we can integrate 3D printing tools and specifically bioprinting into my work, which is more on tissue engineering and stem cell research. So that's how I started. And then later, a few years later, um, I met my husband who lives in, uh, you know, he's based in Bay Area, San Francisco. So we decided to move back to the Bay Area. And that's really how I started transitioning to look at other options outside of academia. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my good friends said, hey, you know, you could take a look at the NSF SBIR grant schemes. Uh, there's a lot of grant opportunities where you could start your own company. Um, so, so yeah, so that's what I did. And I thought, okay, I'll submit a proposal. Um, lo and behold, I got uh, money from NSF to start SC3D. And that's how it all began. So, yeah. So how did, you know, what, what was your entrepreneur journey like? It, it lasted about, what, three years or more? I, I five years, remember. actually. Five <laughs> years, oh my God. Yeah. And, and I knew you were going through a lot of ups and downs and there many struggles and learning. Do you want to share what are some of the milestones that you had uh, with your previous startup and some of the major lessons that you've learned from that? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, with what, one of the greatest things for us was really getting funding, right? Um, and especially non-dilutive funding from um, SBIR schemes and, you know, perhaps other government grant schemes. That was really uh, helpful in helping us to develop the technology, especially if you're at an early stage and you're at proof of concept, right? Getting non-dilutive funding was huge for us. It also builds credibility for the company. It was so much easier for us to have conversations with investors. A lot of times the investors that we're talking to are not familiar with the technology, right? So they rely on government agencies like NSF and other scientific agencies to say, validate your technology. These folks know what they're doing. They got funding. Uh, so that really helped to make the conversations a lot easier. Um, so I would definitely encourage anyone who are going down that path to look at non-dilutive funding. Um, so that was one. And then uh, definitely, you know, throughout, throughout our whole journey, I think the biggest challenge for us is because we're in the education technology space, right? And hardware is hard, uh, as they say. Uh, it is very challenging to get funding um, with the hard, in the, within the hardware space when you're competing against so many software companies who are so much more scalable, right? And I think that was a huge challenge for us. Um, and we, but this, despite all of that, you know, we got some funding, small amounts of funding to sort of pull us through these five years. Um, I think we were able to develop very good solid technology that was, uh, that served its purpose, which is for the educational, you know, teachers, students who wanted access at an affordable price. And we met all of those criteria. Uh, and we've gotten very good response from, you know, the, the educational community as far as, you know, validating what we're doing and embracing what we're doing so, so readily. 
Um, so we were very excited throughout this whole journey. We met a lot of wonderful people uh, who are passionate about driving uh, education forward through technology, and we were able to support them through that process. So overall, I would say, you know, it was a great journey, no regrets whatsoever. Um, if I were to do it again, of course, I would try to not make so many mistakes. Uh, but, you know, it's not easy, right? It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of effort. Um, you know, I was a female founder with a co-founder, but still, you know, there was just a lot of tears and heartaches that went through that five years. So it's definitely not an easy process. Oh, yeah. I mean, I felt sad when you were telling me that you were closing doors. Um, I actually liked your printer, even though I'm not an expert in this field. Uh, I felt the price was affordable. It was, you know, it was well received. At least visually, the product looks pretty good. I mean, the prints look pretty, pretty cool. Yes. And uh, yeah, no, I was weeping with you at the moment. Yeah. Definitely. It was hard, um, you know, but I had to pull the trigger. I think that that was the best thing for the company um, and also for myself, right? I think that we've, we've made it through quite far, uh, but that next step, it wasn't where we wanted to be. And I just don't see a vision moving forward. And I, I think it was a good time to just let it go. Um, but yeah, lessons learned. Um, and yeah, we, we had a great time. Um, everyone in the team had a great time. So, so I think that that was great. And, you know, throughout this time, I've met so many people. So i I still do keep in touch with a lot of these teachers in the community. So yeah, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't mean that your business strategy, you know, was in itself flawed. It, it just may mean as ahead of the time, you know, maybe education uh, in bioprinting is just like too advanced for people to even understand until now, maybe COVID-19 is going to change some of that perspective that emerging technologies like biofabrication could change our lives significantly and quickly. Um, but the other thing I want to mention is you, you said you met a lot of people. I have to agree because you and I both hustle a lot. We, we hustle almost all the time. And I have to say you're one of the most effective person uh, in hustling and making friends and connections and also very generous of making that introduction. And that's why I love to have you to be the bioprinting ambassador for the 3D Heals conference because you know so many people and you also have the scientific insight about you know all these people are doing because I myself don't really understand every single technical aspect. Um, so if you don't mind, uh, would you like to just give people a general overview of what the biofabrication programming is like this year for 3D Heals 2020? Yeah, I'm really excited about the program this year. As I think, as I mentioned, there's a couple tracks that's going on. Uh, one is obviously focused on the applications. Um, so learning a little bit more about what folks are doing. And especially, I think this year, we'll get a chance to really see uh, some of the academic folks transitioning into um, industry, Adam Feinberg, Jordan Miller, um, Stephanie, you know, I think those yeah. are really uh, great things. And I just spoke with Adam and, you know, we were just talking about uh, how he's, when he discovered Fresh or when TJ discovered Fresh, that was, uh, he said, back in uh, 2012. And, you know, it took a very long time to, to develop that technology. And, and I think these are really good hard lessons that we can all learn that will move the industry forward. So I'm excited about that. Um, and then in parallel, there's another track that is more focused on, I would say, supporting tools and materials for bioprinting. So that would be cells, bio inks, um, and other technology platforms. So I think that is also really interesting to get perspective for different uh, manufacturers, so to speak, right, that sort of help support the entire ecosystem for bio biofabrication and bioprinting, right? So from each of these perspectives, what are the challenges that we need to sort of move the needle forward? Um, so I think that's also going to be a really engaging discussion with um, bioprinting suppliers, material providers, and tool providers. Yeah, I mean, for, you know, regular dental or medical 3D printing, we typically talk about materials, printer, and software, these are three components. But I think for biofabrication, there are even more components to it because it's such a complex process. Now we have different kinds of stem cells, different kinds of bio ink with chemical environment to create, to make the cell work and, and survive, you know, stuff that's just a lot more complicated. Absolutely. 
And not to say the regulatory pathway to get any of these technologies through um, to the next phase is also another really uh, interesting discussion, which you know I'm, I'm sure some of these we will touch on as well in, in yeah. topics, yeah. I'm trying to get FDA to talk to us uh, during <laughs> the conference. We'll see how it works, finger yeah. crossed. Hopefully yeah. they have time. Um, one other thing I want to add to the programming is that we actually have at least two speakers from the ISS and NASA, mm. the people who work with them, to talk about how NASA, microgravity, and this kind of uh, literally outer space uh, program actually is relevant to biofabrication and 3D printing in general. Yeah, so I'm pretty excited about that. Yes, absolutely. Um, NASA has always been, uh, you know, an interesting topic and, and studying cells in microgravity. There are so many systems that, you know, has been out there. So, um, yeah, I've had a couple of conversations with uh, um, uh, Joshua, right? Um, and, and also, I think, Rachel as well, um, yeah. who's been doing that work. So I think that'll be really ex exciting to hear what they have for us as far as updates and what are some of the latest things they're working on. Yeah. Well, how are you doing coping with COVID-19 right now? Well, um, you know, it feels like a really long time that we've been home. <laughs> and, you know, I, I mean, I think that um, both my husband and I, we've been, you know, in the lockdown since middle of March, right? But I don't know, it just felt a lot longer. I think what, what, it, what we're happy about is we have this beautiful backyard that we get to enjoy and just sit out. Um, yes, I'm not. Yeah, so I think at least that's my consolation. When I have time, I try to do some gardening. Um, but yeah, the, well, I have a lot in my garden, as, as you know. So <laughs> it keeps me busy on the weekends. It's nice. Thanks. Now, going back to work, unfortunately, that you still have to work. Um, so your current position is um, at uh, Rooster Bio, which is a stem cell, a mesenchymal stem cell startup. Um, what is your work field in this? What is the scope of your work and, you know, what do you do? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. So related to COVID, so MSCs are definitely one of the, um, I would say, uh, front runners for cell therapy uh, targeting COVID because uh, one of the um, symptoms, you know, in severe cases of patients with COVID-19, they will, you know, basically have lung damage, lung injury, and, uh, you know, the ones with the very severe cases, they actually have a symptom called um, ARDS, which is acute respiratory yeah. distress syndrome, and um, that's that's really um, you know that's really where cell therapy can really come into play as far as mediating inflammation, um, mm. reducing the lung injury, and helping to restore the alveoli to you know help the patient breathe properly again. So yeah. MSCs have been a hot topic for the last couple of um, weeks or even months, and. Yeah. In the last month, you know, I actually writ, wrote a couple of blogs um, of how MSCs are being used to treat patients with COVID-19. Um, mm -hmm. We as a company, we talked to several groups who are really interested in using MSCs and trying to work with us to see how we can help to accelerate those programs uh, going into clinical trials. So yeah, we are very excited. Uh, we've been having a lot of discussions, um, you know, with various groups around the world. And I think in the next few months, we're going to see not just data, but you know, a lot more um, interest as well in MS, in the use of MSCs in not just COVID, but other lung related injuries and inflammation and so forth. So I think they're all positive uh, for us uh, as a company for Rooster Bio, and we're you know really excited to be in this space right now. I have to say this conversation really took a very interesting turn with what you just said, because I have no idea. I didn't know that uh, Rooster Bio is involved with the cell therapy. I have to read your blogs. Um, I also heard many other companies who were traditionally in the bioprinting, 3D printing space started to do other things in response to COVID-19. For That's example, right. I believe Melanie from Prelis is creating some kind of antibodies for COVID-19. Right. I like to look deeper into that and see, you know, what angle they're approaching. That's so right. I'm curious if you heard of any other, you know, I would say biofabrication ecosystem is doing something else outside of their, you know, traditional scope currently. Yeah. So I, I don't know if you remember Keith Murphy uh, from Oregon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So Keith is with, with uh, the science and I think they recently announced that they're going to use uh, bioprinting to create a lung model 
um, for looking at how um, to rescue, you know, lung injury in a COVID-19 situation. So yeah. they're working on that. I think that was just announced maybe two weeks ago. Yeah, I think I read that uh, press release. I think it's the name of the company that he currently is at is uh, Vincent Biosciences and it, with Vince, Vincent Biosciences. I think that's the name. Yeah, I'm not, uh, yeah. It's a pharma company that's right. uh, that utilizes bioprinting product for R&D. Right. One other company I'm curious about is actually United Therapeutics right. because it's already a pulmonary disease you know, pharma, pharmaceutical company and it has a very strong biofabrication branch I am curious if they're doing anything along the line of COVID-19 treatment. Um, I don't know uh, about that personally, but uh, you know, I think that, yeah, they're definitely, I would think they will be a front runner in, in looking at that space. So, um, and I, I think their profile fits very well into positioning themselves to uh, do something that's related to COVID-19. So, so yeah, definitely somebody to look out to. I almost think that another webinar uh, before even June to talk about how the biofabricating, com biofabrication community is coming together to search for new therapy, new vaccine development, new strategies will be a very interesting topic. Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm, I'm about to write a blog about that too, um, as I was reading up and just you know, kind of figuring out what you were mentioning as well, like who's doing you know, what in the biofabrication space and how are they positioning themselves to um, find cures and treatments for COVID. So I think that would be an interesting discussion. Yeah, I think if anything, I mean, people, to some people, there's a good opportunity to be more visible to the more traditional general medical community, especially, you know, if you're in an immersion technologies like 3D printing, bioprinting, stuff that sound almost like, you know, in a normal peacetime, either accessory or kind of two way out, right. you know, yeah. and now at this time of emergency, does these, these technologies become possibly the lifesaver? Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Yep. I, and you're right. I think that a lot of these crisis situation is forcing us to look at things that we don't normally look at and, you know, pushing more attention and really, I would say a concerted effort, right? So, you know, that's very true in the cell therapy space where now we're seeing all these people very interested in using MSCs. And um, as a whole, I'm excited because that's gonna be very helpful when we start seeing this data, right? All of these clinical trials in the next, you know, we're not talking about years, we're talking about months or even yeah. weeks that we're gonna get all of this data very, very quickly. So I think that's gonna be very exciting that we're gonna yeah. get a ton of data uh, what's really difficult or challenging is obviously the clinical trial design, right? Because everybody is, has a slightly different strategy, you know, and then how do we consolidate all of the data and the trial design itself has to be good as far as, you know, um, finding the right endpoints so that you could actually gain value from actually reading and understanding the data. So all of that are, is, is very critical, I think. Yeah, I'm also hoping that people's memory is not too short. Um, <laughs> that we don't just care about R&D and science and technology while we're in crisis, but also when we're over this, yes. that we can continue to increase funding to the space and the discussion around it, and hopefully attract more young people to come to the field and continue to grow, because this is the future they're going to build for themselves. Yeah. Um, well, Maya, thank you so much for your time today. Um, very much looking forward to your June presentation and thanks a lot for being our ambassador for bioprinting again this no year. No problem. Yeah, no, it's a, been a pleasure. And uh, you know, I've always enjoyed working with you, Jenny. So yeah, this is, this is gonna be awesome.